I want to emphasize that choice is the fundamental power of the human experience. Number two is every one of us lives in complete unawareness of how powerful every choice you make is. And number two, how many choices you make in a microsecond. That every, that, you know, that people tend to think that a choice is, should I have coffee or tea? That it's an, something you're conscious of. What should I wear? Um, that, that you, you know, should I go to a workshop or not? That a choice, this is what you think of as a choice. Every single thing, your response to weather, your response to, 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 to what you respond to as you see, beautiful day, not beautiful day, nice mountain, not, not nice mountain, oh, there's a bird, hate birds, love birds, da, 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 da. It, every single, what you need to do is imagine that you are like a sparkler sparking off responses, reactions, and every one of those is a choice. That energy is always in motion. This is a law of the universe. This is one of the laws. Every law of science is a, has its mystical law counterpart. There isn't one law of science that does not have its celestial mystical counterpart. Every single one, because the physical laws are in fact a reflection of the mystical laws. You are always in motion. You are never not making choices. The significance of understanding a chart like this is that you kind of get a grasp of the different levels of choices that you make. The speed at which these choices influence your relationship to the creation of matter and the uncreation of it. I'm going to say that again. This is, this is not just a jewel. This is like the Maharaji ruby. The speed at which this choice I'm making is going to densify into matter. I'm going to give you an example. This one needs an example or a dozen. One of the <clears throat> teachings of Carl Jung was there's nothing lower than herd, the herd mind, the mind of the group, the mad mind. The mind that screams, you know, kill him, kill him, sacrifice him. The, the, the madness that happens when you blend your individual thinking mechanism and you toss it over to what the group believes and you cease to be able to reason. You cease to be able. The way I think that a lot of people are tossing their minds over to people in the political race. They're not reasoning. They're no longer reasoning, they're hysterical. And archetypally, we've reached a place of hysteria because we are reliving, as, as you'll, you'll see when we get to archetypes, the archetypal patterns of the Civil War, World War I, as it then gave way to the beginning of World War II and the Nazi era. The exact same dynamics are in place. Exact, exact, exact. Wars repeat themselves because history repeats themselves itself. This is a law. This is a law. History repeats itself unless you learn and break the pattern even in your own life. You'll repeat yourself unless you choose to break the pattern. What's a mystical law? These are laws. These are laws. You'll repeat yourself unless you yourself break the pattern. 
What is, here's a law, what's in one is in the whole. What we do as individuals, we will redo as society because if we redo it as an individual, it creates the whole. We're the engines of society. The moment the Southern Republicans withdrew their support from the president, it was a declaration of the Civil War and the pattern engaged the pattern engaged. Now my point here is that when a person takes their individual mind and tosses it and becomes part of the way the group thinks without thinking anymore and becomes a we instead of an I and just, well, He's a Muslim, he wasn't born here, he's this, he's that, they're short, they're this, they're that, they're all this, they're all coming at us, they're this, whatever it is. They're no longer able to be, to be rational. Any kind of we thought, that converts to the speed at which you can heal anything. And number two, it also converts to the to your immune system and its susceptibility to epidemics. Group mind, group immune system, epidemics are a product of the collective becoming toxic. And now we are living in an era of one epidemic surfacing per year. And that's never happened before. And it is an indicator that our collective immune system, our collective thinking, has become collectively toxic, fragile, and frightened. This is not something that an ordinary person in, and I don't mean ordinary by the way I mean it, but say the common mind could grasp this is a mystical perspective. This, you've got to be off, you've got to be up here. Any more than down here, this is creationism. The, the world was literally created in six days. You have to come up here and, and recognize that is a mystical code. Not a literal one, but if you take it literally, the healing, the code, can't come through to you. If you are in the tribal mind, you cannot access energy medicine. It's not going to happen. Acupuncture won't help you. It might alleviate pain for an hour. An hour! but it won't help you. Someone in the tribal mind cannot be helped by homeopathy, acupuncture, not even massage. It might alleviate the stress feeling for an afternoon, but believe you me, it'll be right back there. It's not possible because they are too dense. They have too much time in them and their health has too many other people's mind involved. Their illness is not a product of just their personal choice, but of the choices of millions of people that they have plugged into. Am I making sense here? They have a tribal disorder, not an individual one. So if they say, well, what's the one reason? It's not a one reason. You are a product of a tribal disorder. Tribal. So you have to heal at the rate. And so I can treat you, but acupuncture is an individual treatment of an individual energy field. And I, and I can't alleviate the prejudice of a tribe that is in your blood and bones now with needles. I can't do it. I have to find a medical treatment that the tribe approves of, chemotherapy. 
The tribe likes chemotherapy. The tribe likes this. How about that? Now that's something the tribe believes in. So I have to go find tribal medicine. And it will heal you or not at the speed of the tribe. Because if I take you out of the tribe and I say, we're going to try this, we're going to try a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this, the tribe will respond with hostility because you are now operating with something that has thought forms that go faster than they can reason. Said differently, they are working with with a with light that has the capacity to destroy the dark in the cell tissue to burn the time to work faster than the time which means that your thought forms will change faster than theirs and they won't be able to maintain authority over you if you want to put it in the language of consciousness if you use these, you will come to an understanding that's outside of the way we understand. We can't allow that. So it's, at that point, follow me. You've got to follow me. It's got nothing to do with healing. It's got to do with sabotaging the consequence of how you will see reality if this works. Can you repeat that? Mm -hmm. I can repeat it. Is this making sense? It's got to do with the reason why, let's say that you're my child, and I'm your mama, and I'm very traditional. I'm, I'm someone who believes in creationism. I'm a fundamentalist. I believe that the, world, that the Bible says exactly. I'm a first chakra person. I'm a good person, but this is what I believe. And I want you to believe that, and all the rest of my children. Now you get sick, and I take you to a doctor, and the doctor is, says, you know, we need, to, we need to, to have chemotherapy, and we need to have this, and we need to have this. And everybody in the tribe understands, and the family has, knows this doctor, knows that's it. You have to have surgery, you have to be in the hospital, and everybody understands this. Then a nurse comes in and says, you know what, there's also some other things we can do here. I want you to read these books. And it's about, you know, um, talking about how you're feeling, middle column. Talking about, you know, what's going on in your life and what your feelings are and, you know, like maybe making some different choices. Maybe your, your nutrition, maybe, you know, did, did you ever want to do something? Do you like your job? Do you like what you're doing? Because maybe, maybe this is a good time for you to evaluate your personal choices. Instead of, and you say to me, well, I don't know, I don't know. I'll come back the next day and we'll talk about it. This is too fast for you. We can't, I'll give you more time, first column. I'll give you a little more time. Because you need more time. Because you're still, you have to first think all about the tribe. Because that's what you're used to. So I come back the next day and I nudge you a little bit more, a little bit more, because you've got the tribe in your head. There's not just one of you. There's a whole tribe I'm talking to. Because you have to heal at the speed of all of them. So then the next day I come in and I say, so that is just you and me, just you and me. When you have a tribe in your head, you're thinking, what will they say? This is the they you talk about. What will they say? This is my imitation of being on the cross. What will they say? <laughs> and I try to get you to talk just about you. So you start talking, you say, well, I don't know, you know, I kind of always, I'm always doodling, and, and I kind of always wanted to do something artistic. And, and I say, what? you know what? When you get sick, Sometimes it's the greatest gift in the world because it can be a game changer. It's an opportunity for you to say, you know what? Life needs to be about what I want to do, if I can. 
I need to make some fundamental choices because I'm not happy here. And this is, I'm not happy. I'm not here to make them happy. I'm not happy. And now all of them in your head are going like this. <laughs> and you're thinking how, and now it's all going on in here. But something in your middle is beginning to feel like, now we're talking. And it's the little engine that could. And this spark feels like it has a different voltage than the tribal. This one feels like. And that seems like, I don't know, this has a different hum, buzz to it. It feels more, I'm getting high off of this. I'm frightened, but I'm high. The agony ecstasy, the, the, there's a bolt to this. It feels like lightning light. And the other feels like just getting by. Just enough to get by. Regular versus super lead. And once this spark starts, it will not leave you alone. It is relentless. Comes to visit every morning. Remember me? Spark, spark. And it starts to hurt you if you don't plug it into something. It will start to hurt you. Which is its greatest, it's like, I'm going to start to bite you. I'm really going to start to make you miserable. I will, I will, I will, I will. And it's the best thing I can do is make you so eager to try out your own life. You don't belong to other people. You don't, don't, don't. You can hang with them. You can love them. You can be part of their life. But you've got to find out who you are. I'm going to hit a pause button. This may come as news to a lot of people, but you were not born knowing yourself. You know nothing about yourself unless you go and figure that out. You don't even know what you like. You don't know what makes you tick. You don't know what your shadow is and you don't know what your light is. You don't know what your potential is. You don't know how deeply you can love and you don't even know how deeply you can hate. You don't know any of that stuff. You don't even know what your archetypes are. You don't even know what your patterns are. You know zilch about yourself unless you decide to know yourself. And for most people, what they know is their wounds and they think that's a big deal. And that, quite frankly, is boring. And it gets you into trouble if you start there. You become just a bore. Because you never get into your power. You never get into the good stuff because you get such a kick out of the dark stuff. Because it becomes such good street currency. Oh, I've been wounded, I've been wounded. Oh, geez, now what? Well, I get the best seat in the house and you have to talk to me in a certain way. No, I don't. Oh, you're so rude. The power of the wound. When you discover yourself, you have to tell the tribe. And they're not going to want you to do that. So when you say to them, the nurse came by and she suggested I read this pamphlet. And I did. So I think that I'm going to try out, you know, I'm going to go to this place and get a Pilates teacher and maybe, get a, maybe you learn a little yoga. And I might try this nutritional program. I'm going to I think I'm going to cut out fried foods because I don't think it's really good for what I'm going through. We always eat fried food. Now, they're not going to want you to follow that. Not because it's not good for you, but because you're saying you're different. And they're not going to be able to support that. Not at all. Very few will be able to say, good for you, you're different than us, and we're wrong. And we're eating unhealthy. They're not going to be able to, well, what, what's wrong with the way I cook? Are you saying there's something wrong with the way I cook? What are you saying here? This isn't about you. It's not about me. They'll make it about them. They'll, and they'll just create another stress. 
And you'll just, no, it's not, all right, fine, give me some fried chicken. And, do you see what I'm going here? And it's very difficult, and what happens is they'll reel you in so that the speed at which you heal is something they can live with. When in fact, this was an opportunity for you to say, I could heal, I could take, if I get your mind out of my mind, what I'm actually doing is altering the speed at which I can heal. I can increase the, my potential to heal a lot faster if I get your thought forms out of mine. Are you following this? Because here, because every thought form that you hold on to is psychic weight. And the more weight, the longer you have to wait for everything. That's your formula. Weight equals weight. This is how we create our relationship to time. In all things, in all things. In everything. This is how time is, our, how we really, which is why when you're having a great time and you are fully present, it feels like it, it feels like it just flew by. Like did all that time really go? And when you are absolutely like, I, if I don't get out of here, it feels like forever because you're not fully present and you're anchored everywhere else and every minute feels like a day and every day feels like a year. You're playing games with where you are in your head, with perception, and you've anchored yourself to the densest first chakra perceptions. Illness has a lot to do with being anchored in dense perceptions. with being anchored in dense perceptions. Okay. Okay, so now to continue this endless story, but it's important. I hope you don't mind me telling it this way, but I feel like getting to the point where the light bulb went on is kind of a journey that helps me to teach this. A little bit. When I was into why people don't heal, I learned a great deal about us, and therefore you, which is how dark and manipulative we can be. How many of our choices are choices that are simply not good, and how deep and 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 how important it is. Bless you for us to get a handle on our own shadow. On our own shadow. Which is, now, I'm gonna shift gears here and go to what was happening in our society, because it's important. Simultaneously in our society, um, as the shadow was becoming very popular to look at, the wounded child, the orphan child, blah, 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 all of that, it's very significant to look at this part of ourselves. But what was happening is that the body, mind, spirit template was getting morphed into the body, mind, mind. And nobody, there was very little, and the spirit part was becoming a mental companion and not truly a road to a spiritual journey. That how people were, if you look at the literature, you look at what was happening at the time, the books that came out, the experience, anything about God became more of a mental, examination then in fact what the spiritual path was all about yoga became an exercise when in fact it's a spiritual practice became what people did at lunchtime 
and no mention of God or spirit was allowed because it was an exercise. It became the thing that was very vogue. It went along with change of nutrition. It went along retreats became about silence. <laughs> okay. Prayer in any form. I cannot tell you how many times people would say, I didn't come here to pray and it was a workshop on spirituality. <laughs> so I stopped introducing anything at all. The hostility toward God, the hostility toward religion was completely being mixed with a hostility toward God and believing. Believing in anything. And it became obvious to me as the decade wore on that the theology people had was that what they became, their faith, they had more faith in what they didn't believe than in faith in what they did. And that what people put on the table when you talked about God was their defiance of this is what I don't believe. And they knew that for sure. But they had absolutely no idea what they did believe. And in fact, believing anything the belief mechanism had grown rusty, if not completely broken. People did not know how to believe, much less what to believe. So it was not a surprise to me at all that turning to fundamentalism had become rampant because fundamentalism is routine and ritual. It's not faith. It's routine and ritual and community. But it is not a mystical experience. It is not an experience of God. It is simply a community control and, and ritual. But, that's, but it is by no means the mystical outlet. In the meantime, we're living in a society in which having faith in anything is not paying off. The banks are betraying us, the Wall Street is, the church is, priests are, you name it, it's going down. And at a more personal level, marriages have never been more corrupt. It doesn't matter if you take a vow or anything, There's, having faith in another person is a crapshoot. So the whole faith mechanism, and in fact, Having faith in yourself has become an effort. Keeping your word for, to yourself. The, the, in classes, it has been banned to even have a class on moral conscience. And what is the conscience in, in, in public schools? That's banned because it's considered religious. You can't even bring up conscience, conscience, the mechanism of what is right and what is wrong. What is, and that is tied to your intuition. That is the trigger word, and we get to the power of words, for how you know your basic intuition. What is your conscience? That's your second degree of intuition the fundamental working of your conscience, the nature of light and shadow, right and wrong, and what is nature's way, a return to ordinary, a return to balance. I feel like I, 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 this isn't right, this is right, da, da. This is your gut instinct. It follows the guidance of conscience. And one of the things we did was we tossed out the word conscience, we never use it, and we use the word consciousness, which means nothing, nothing at all. It can mean whatever we want. I'm very conscious, I recycle. Well, I'm very conscious, I eat wheats and berries. But it has nothing, when someone says they're on a seminar on consciousness, nobody ever, ever, ever associates morality with that word. Ethics, justice, nobody, confession, writing your ship inside, 
Nobody. And yet, let's go back down. Intuition relies on conscience. You can never be a clear intuitive if you don't have an active conscience. It is not possible. Not at all. Not possible. Zero. Cannot. Is that puzzling to you? Okay. Can't. Can't. You will. You will make things up. You will make things up. You will simply make it up. Because you have no capacity to trust yourself. And number two is, if you do not read your own clearly, what will happen to you is this. You will live with two words as your sidekick. I blame that person for everything. And number two, you will live in a world of, I deserve this. I've had a bad day. I deserve that. Number three, you will live in a constant state of self-inflicted wounds and suffering. You will, and, and you can't, you won't be able to heal any of this, and the likelihood that you will become an addict is 90%. You'll become an addict to behavior patterns, you'll become an addict to self-pity, maybe drugs, maybe food, maybe booze, but you will be an addict. There's no way, to, you will, there is, it is impossible, impossible, impossible not to be an addict. Questions? <laughs> no. No, no. If you have questions about it, what do you need? You want me to repeat that? It's worth repeating. Do you need a repeat? Yes. Okay. When you block out your conscience, you block out a fundamental monitoring system that keeps you balanced. You don't listen to yourself. So you'll repress it. But you will feel it. You'll feel it in your blood and your bones. In order to deal with this, because you have blocked out the mechanism, you have to find some, you have to project it out. It's obviously not you, because you're not reflective. Can't figure out what you've done. Because you're not listening to yourself. So it must be something in the outside world, must be someone in the outside world. Because not you, because you're not paying attention to yourself. You don't ask yourself, you don't question, what did, I, what did I do here? What kind of choice did I make? Where is it coming from? Why did I do that? But instead you turned your wounded, oh, I'm so wounded. Maybe that, I, I'm, I'm passing on my suffering. Why? Because I want to. Because I want to. Because I deserve to. You're playing that game. And then what happens is you get into this cycle because it works for you, or however it is you do. And you blame another situation, another person, another place. My childhood, my this, my future childhood, I don't know, some karma, whatever. In order to stay in the cycle you're in. And in order to not progress here. In order to not go a stage up in, con in, in your awareness of the choices you're making and why, you'll level off. And to maintain leveling in the dark, you have to be an addict. Because inevitably, the light will try and come through. And every time it does, it's called truth. You'll drug it in some way. You'll drug the light. So you'll either be an alcoholic, a, a food addict, a, a, a behavior addict. It's time for me to scream. You'll be some kind of addict that will stop the light from coming through, which is the realization. I, this is, I'm, I'm doing something not right here. I, and because the realization is always about, truth is always about recognizing I'm doing something that's not OK here. Because that's what growth is. And it always is about, I have to make some different choices here. And that shifts the playing field of your life, which shifts everything, the capacity to heal, what you can get, what you're like, the types of illnesses you're likely to get now versus these. 
It shifts everything. The infusion of truth changes everything. Now, did that make sense to you? But you will be an addict. That's where addicts come from, yeah. Oh, it's, is, is the antithesis the opposite of that? No, another style is self-blame. Blame is blame. And you never just blame yourself. If you're a blamer, you'll blame anything that comes along. <laughs> yeah, but if you're hard on yourself, you'll be hard on others. It just depends on, on your need. Today it's hard on others, tomorrow it's hard on the system, tomorrow, third it's hard on the airlines, fourth, you'll always be, if you're a blamer, you're a blamer, it's an archetype. You know, it's an archetype. It depends on the circumstance. If it's a memory about something, then you're hard on yourself. If it's this, it depends, you, a blamer's never not a blamer. It's a lifestyle. And maybe there are some things that are like, perfume blame incidences in which you have something. But then there are eau de toilette, there's cologne, there's you know major and minor. But if you're a blamer, you're a blamer. Blaming yourself is guilt? Blaming yourself is guilt. You have guilt. You know, you have guilt for something. But, but a bl blame comes from, there's got to be a reason, one reason and, and, and that's a blame is like, there, and that person, there's one reason for this and da, da, da. It's, and it's a need to actually come to the one cause and oneness and oneness why that one thing happened. Blame says, I know exactly why this happened and, it, and if I hadn't done this, it just wouldn't have happened and I am in control. Blamers kid themselves about their control. Are you a control freak? Yeah. No, no, that would be a yes or a no answer here. You don't get to interpret. This would be yes or no. I said control. As, as evidenced by you wandering down the <laughs> path thinking I'm not hot on your heels. <laughs> but look, or, look behind you and there I am. You didn't answer my question. They should let me interview a politician. I said, yeah. No, that, that's a form of control. That's a form of control and, and we all have that. We all have that and um, but when blame becomes the lifestyle, every one of us says, you know, I have episodes of blame. Blame episodes, episodic behavior is not a, uh, an archetypal pattern. <coughs> we all have episodic behaviors of blame. I'm talking when it becomes, when the blamer is an archetype. But I will tell you when there is a stage of consciousness at which it's a lifestyle. Because you don't want to look at something, so you keep projecting out. When, and when you are a blamer, when blaming and um, uh, treating yourself, I deserve, deserve, I, and even when you think that person deserves, that per person doesn't deserve this. When you think in these words, and they are part of the lexicon of your reality, the, the scale, like the lady of the scales. Like, like the way we think, this kind of stuff is so startling to me. When there are big disasters, like I remember all the write-ups, do you remember that big tsunami in the South Pacific, was it the Philippines or was it Indonesia. Indonesia and all those people, and what were they saying? All those innocent people, really? Or should we have emptied prisons and said, okay, all you innocent people on these boats, all you people guilty, get on there, you're gonna die now. What do you mean by innocent people? What the heck are we talking about? What does that mean? 
What a ridiculous way to think. That you mean that people need to deserve and do something bad before a natural disaster? That unless they've done something bad, they shouldn't die? And if, one, if two or more people die at one time, that, that somehow or other, that unless they've done something bad to deserve it? This is how we think. And this is, an, this is a flaw in our fundamental mechanism that says there is a myth that if we're good, bad things shouldn't happen to us. And that that's how this off-planet God works. That if we're good little children, this is how thick the myth is it comes through our journalists. Nobody is, is writing the newspaper saying, excuse me, but I don't believe in this off-planet God. We just accept this as a social creed. That they're innocent people. Innocent, who's judging them? Well, they didn't do anything to deserve. Well, then if they had, who should have decided that? The cosmic court. But who's God? I mean, who, who, where, where are you getting this? It's because collectively we have this idea, this belief, this primal tribal belief that if we are good, bad things shouldn't happen to us. That is the primal law of karma that is in our nature. This is the nature of our nature. That says somehow or other, if I stay balanced, I gotta figure out what that balance is. Otherwise, if I don't deserve things, I get to do some bad things. If, if bad things happen to me and I don't deserve them, I get to do bad things in return to other people because bad things happen to me. I get to punish other people. I get to make them feel bad and pass on my injuries to them, and that's what people do. I get to come home with a bad day and yell at them and beat them up for my bad day. I deserve it because I've had a bad day. Okay, so long as people live in that consciousness, they'll be an addict. They will be addicts. They'll be an addict to their own wounds and the power of their wounds. They'll be an addict to their own privilege. Didn't you, I came here to see you, you have to talk to me. They'll be an addict, they'll be an addict to something. And they can't get out of it. And that's this level of consciousness. And this level comes with a certain speed. So if you gave me a list of illnesses, I'll say, if you're in this speed, you can't heal it. This kind of illness requires this kind of speed. I'm telling you, it's just mechanics. It's law. It's law. You're not, you've got too much density in you for that illness. Now, it's just law. It's like the teacher, Jesus. These and other things can you heal, but just learn the laws. Stop it. Bam, he should have slapped them around. Get out of yourselves. That's what healing is about. Get out of yourselves. And one of the greatest gifts you can learn, one of the biggest jewels, here's a crown jewel, stop taking yourself personally. Stop it. You are not the center of the universe. Stop it. Stop treating yourself like you are. Stop thinking you're privileged. Stop thinking you're special. Stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Your whole life is going to go down better. Stop it. Nothing about life was structured for you. Nothing. Not being a mother, dear God, all these people, when they put baby on board, what are you supposed to do with that? Not hit the car? <laughs> I don't care if you have a baby on board. What am I supposed to do with that? Actually, I want a sign that says dog on board. Abby on board. You know what? Ugh. 
you know. Um, there's nothing, nothing, nothing special. And that's where you, the moment you start thinking you are is the moment you think the laws of the universe do not apply to you. And you will become a lawbreaker. You will break the laws. And you will think you have a right to break the laws. Because you're extraordinary and the laws don't apply to you. You will become a lawbreaker. You'll become a metaphysical criminal if not a physical one. And you'll think you're special and you get to break the laws. They don't apply to me. And you'll be the person who says to me, I can't believe this illness happened to me. Why? Because I'm special. I'm special. I mean, I didn't do anything to deserve this. I'm special. Well, who did you think should get this illness? Well, that person across the street. I drive a Jaguar. And they don't. They drive a Honda. This is a Honda illness. <laughs> After all. OK, this is how people think. This is how I get the laws don't apply. I named my child Sunshine Meditation Karma so that ordinary things wouldn't happen to the child. And now something ordinary is happening. The system doesn't work. There is no God. There isn't, isn't, isn't. This is how human beings think. And they're all wrong. Yeah, honey. I'm sorry, darling, I'm going to have to have David give you the microphone. So there's been a massive movement uh, in self-development in recent years, and kind of simply, what you're saying, it seems like simply creating an additional addiction of being special. And I'm just curious to your take, would you shine some light on the cultural and the historical kind of roots of when this started and why it's seems to be so prevalent, especially in the West right now. Yeah, because it actually feeds into this. And that's the birth of the inner self. Your timing's perfect. I really do credit entering the nuclear age. And I cannot emphasize enough that when we entered that age, well, let me say it this way. I brought up yesterday, but I brought this up yesterday, and it, it's such a big deal that our design, our basic nature, is like we have two wheels in us, and it's the we have that 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 make up the human design. We have the need to create and the need to survive. These are the two wheels that make us our species. Uh, but, you know, all the other species have the need to survive, but we have that extra wheel, which is the need to create. So if you look at the history of our species, we're always, you know, creating from the wheel to fire to the next, to the next, to the next. And our mythologies, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, all the stories of mythology, study the mythologies and... Uh, from the, everything you can get your hands on, Asian mythologies. There's stories about creation and whether the gods approved, whether the gods inspired it. One of the myths that are, is applicable to your question, particularly, is the myth of Prometheus stealing the fire from Zeus. And how he was so enraged, he hung Prometheus out to have the, the birds eat his liver constantly, but he sent to punish Earth. He got his goddesses together and he says, create me a false goddess, create me a fraud, but make her an attractive broad. Because I'm going to give her to Epimetheus as a, the brother of Prometheus, who, by the way, had warned his brother and said, don't accept anything from the gods. I'm telling you, they can be very cheeky. But Hermes was called and delivered this handmaiden goddess. But as they were going about leaving heaven, well, Olympus, 
Zeus gave Pandora a box and said, here's your wedding present. Don't open it. And he's laughing because he had said to, to, to Athena and, and, and Hermes, you make sure she is very beautiful but particularly curious. And then he says, don't you open this wedding present. Shows up at the door of Epimetheus, and of course, she opens it up. And everybody knows that in Pandora's box are all the toils of humanity, illness and grief, struggle, poverty, and of course, hope. Now, I want to fast forward. That myth, the myth was one of the formative archetypal just like, the, just like Sisyphus pushing the rock. These were the myths of power that somehow formed our sense of who we are as, as human. And we could go into the myths, why I love them. They imprint us. We say, I gotta try again. Jesus, I'm always trying again to get that over the top. And I feel like it's crushing me. I am the phoenix, we've gotta rise from the ashes. We have to keep going. When we entered the nuclear age, we stole the fire a second time. We stole it a second time. And this time, Zeus, in our preposterous rage, we stole the fire again. And we felt we, with the fire, we became a Zeus out of control. And we unleashed a Pandora's box of such weaponry that our fundamental mechanism became dysfunctional. For the first time in the history of humanity, the history since our birth, our basic nature, our basic gut, our basic design, which is to create and survive, there's nothing we can create that guarantees our survival for the first time ever. We have morphed ourselves. There's nothing. For the first time ever in the history of humanity, <coughs> we exist moment to moment wondering if we will survive. And that has morphed us. That has morphed us. It has morphed us in, it has positioned us in an extraordinary way, from the way in which we create these stories of end times that fill our movie theaters endlessly, to just the other day, just the other day, I saw one of those taglines that go across the, on the news that said, you know, by the year two, 2000, whatever, I won't be here, but, well, if I am, I won't remember that I'm here, but <laughs> it says that a colony will be on Mars. And the reason these scientists want it is for two. One, just to, that because they think we should become a multi-planetary species, and two, because they feel they have to have a second place to go if we self-destruct. It's how stupid we are. This is how stupid. And we would self-destruct because of our stupid religious mythologies. That's how, for the, our, our preposterous fairy tales. Now, this Pandora's mythology that we're at and our inability to create relies upon us finally getting to the point where the only thing that can outwit is the power of our consciousness and soul 
to get the mechanism back in gear. In order to do that, we have to transcend and toss out spiritual religious mythologies. They're done. They're done. And we have to get into the impersonal power that is the human spirit. The mystical power that is inherently universal within the human being. That has to be the new spirituality, is the way we are designed, is the creative force within us. That is universal. Laws have no religion. Okay? They have no religion. But prayer is that which makes the universe intimate. And what a miracle is, is when God bends the laws for you. So this universe is completely intimate, but it doesn't have a religion. And what I, have no, no, what I know all too well is that clinging to a religion, and you know that I am like a Catholic girl, but clinging to the religion instead of the mystical truths that are the gold from each religion, clinging to the tribal aspect is the most destructive thing you can do. You take the jewels, take the laws that are hidden in the religion, take the laws, the mystical teachings, the laws in Buddhism, what Buddha taught, change is constant, Change is constant. Cooperate with change. You'll fall into suffering if you do not. Take the Kabbalah, the way the tree of life exists in your body. Take the mystical traditions. Learn how the biology and the mystical traditions are built in us. Why? Because what is in one is in the whole. We are the same as the map of nature in everything. What balances us will balance nature. We are the micro of the ecological system. If we return to our own balance, we are balancing nature simultaneously. What is in one is in the whole. We are nature's balancing elements. We are one with the system. As I bring myself to balance, I'm balancing nature. We are balancing by our actions. I, do you, are you getting this? This is, we are the ecological system. It's not just the water. We are it. It's a collective mechanism. We are the inner net. <laughs> 